Welcome to the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the exploration and cultivation of the outside genius found in neurodivergence. Hey everyone, welcome to the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast. This week we're going to talk about how the normal people are starting to realize what it's like to be us because we are the ones who are most sensitive and we're always ahead. So right now we're really struggling, but I'm seeing more and more articles that are saying the urge for normalcy is dysfunctional. And this is hilarious to me because we've lived in a society that was all about being normal and that was so important. And now that things are going sideways, those people out there who are seeking normalcy and will pretend it is at any cost are now being labeled dysfunctional. <laughs> and I'm like, well, everybody's lived dysfunctional and that's pretty much what we've always felt and there is no average or normal or appropriate or whatever and so pretty soon the labels will just be fully spread across and there'll be no not wanting to be neurodivergent because it'll be like whatever normal is now dysfunctional neurodivergent is dysfunctional everybody's dysfunctional so welcome to dysfunctional land where we make money off of everybody's dysfunction now what i want to do is i want you to make money off of your high function and to get there, we have to first figure out what your high functioning is. And that's what this whole podcast is trying to cover about mostly me and my family's high functioning. I throw in a little bit about other people I know, but I don't want to put too much out there because it's about you personally and you need to come to me to help you figure that out. And so if I were to give you the whole kit and caboodle, well, then I would be broke. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I follow this one thing on Substack called OK Doomer, which I think is great. And it's one of the ones I recommend on my Substack thing. If you want to go out there and check it out, I put some stuff up. The first one I found was hilarious was this one on COVID. And sure, COVID can kill you, but have you ever taken a hot shower? And then the next one was, you're not a fear monger. You have sentinel intelligence, which is us guys. We have high sensing intelligence. We have spatial giftedness and that's what sentinel intelligence is. They have a different way of spelling it or saying it or whatever. And that's kind of like the more spiritual side, but spatial giftedness is what I consider the spiritual intelligence, but it's way bigger than that. And I see it very complexly. I think that we've been broadly glossing over it because our society hasn't talked about it. So those who have been addressing it have been really on the spiritual side. The religious side sort of talks about it. It recognizes people who can see visions and all this stuff. And it's like calls them spiritual gifts. And they want you to use it for God, but they kind of control how you do it. And I'm saying, no, it's bigger than that. It's just artistic gifts. It's your ability to model spatially in your head. And I'm giving you a new language to understand it because those of us with it, we're the creatives and the creatives are being shoved out of the system because it's not for creatives. It's about regurgitation. So I'm trying to show you what it looks like when you have accepted you're being shoved out of the system and you go into it and you make your own way because guess what? The future is going to be for the creatives. AI is making it so that we can see what is average and now we can expand our intelligence we can take what we know about the world and what they think they see and how it's seen, and we can bridge the gap between what our truths are and what the society's truths are, and we can make money in that gap. That's where the money's made. What I'm trying to do is teach you how to use it applicably, not to heal yourself. That will happen, I believe, just naturally, but to use it so that you can survive. Because right now, healing is an optional plus. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have to eat, you have to sleep, you have to have shelter way before you get to self-actualization. And I want you to get there while healing yourself. I want you to get there while finding success, while finding a profession, while making your way. And I think that in the previous generations, there was a large enough middle class where if dad worked or mom worked and she made enough money that dad could focus on the kids. If you had a creative child, you could help them figure out a way to go into their creativity so they could create their own way of living in, in and being and doing. This is exploding right now. Your own way of living, being and doing is how the upper class has always been able to foster their out their children. And I'm gonna guess, you know, based on just the experience that I see from reading and my experience of just having interacted with a fair amount of upper class people, the upper class is a lot of creatives, but there's somebody who figures out a way to make money at it and then they pass that money down, pass that money down so that they can still continue to be creative but it's at the cost of the lower class creatives. And in the lower class, you probably have more creative people. You have more amazing people, but they end up on drugs. They end up on, they end up going to prison. They end up going into horrible situations because there's no space for them. It's like they're told to be something they're not. And I know for me, I was told to fit in 
and work for other people. And it was really hard because I didn't want to do it the way they're doing it. They have many more steps than I needed. They make me go and do processes I do. And I don't learn how to do it when they make me do it their way. I want to figure out how to do it on my own. I need some space to do that. Once you give me a couple times of going through it, I'm off running in a more efficient manner. But we weren't allowed that. We had to recreate it the way they did, which didn't make sense for me because a lot of those steps I just didn't need because I'm so high sensing. I could see and feel. I know one of the things that used to drive me insane is like, I always started off with my interviews first. They're like, no, you're supposed to look at the documentation first. I'm like, no, I need to start off with my interviews because if I look at the documentation without my interviews, I don't understand what it's saying. It doesn't have context for me. But the second I'm talk to people and I see what they're talking about, I see what their issues are, then I look at the documents and then they have context. And then it's clear as day. And then I find stuff nobody else ever did or nobody else could ever see. And I came, I come back and ask another round of questions because you're supposed to. And that's when I was able to uncover stuff that other people didn't feeling my way through the questioning because you can get things out of people that they would never share on paper. Sharing them in real life, that's a conversation. Nobody's checking that. But sharing them on paper, everybody has to check themselves. They also have to make sure that they're covering their butts. So you're not getting the truth. Paper is is not truthful. Paper is is safe. So when you write on paper, you put context, you, you leave context out because there's always things you can do with it in real life that you would be afraid to actually admit you're doing but it's actually a huge part of the process. So I always found the interviews to be the most important. I started with the interviews and I went from there. But man, I got repeatedly told that this is not the way you do it. This is not the way you do it. And I'm like, well, if I'm so bad at that, why do I keep finding stuff? Why do I keep getting bigger and better projects? I want you to understand that what you're being told is people who are conditioned, people who who think you're supposed to do it that way. And now I'm seeing these articles that are saying, it's not so great to be conditioned. And I think the ones like, sure, COVID can kill you, but have you ever taken a hot shower is a great example. It's about this Bob Watcher, who's a San Francisco doctor who has a reputation of sort of understanding COVID, but not really. And he talks about getting COVID. He talks about how he wears his mask forever, even though he takes it off indoors to eat in the farmer's markets and when there's not that many people. And he doesn't worry about if it's not too crowded in a room, he'll take it off. And then he admits that the vaccines and boosters wear off at two to three months, but he's not worried. But then he gets COVID. And so he passes out due to COVID because of a COVID syncope. And if you're like me, you have syncope without COVID. So great. When you get it, it's worse. And he collapses in the shower. They take him to the doctor and he gets really great health care and his health care helps him and he's laughing. And, and the person who writes it like, well, I'm not Bob. I'm going to die if this happened to me. Like nobody's going to come and help me to the hospital. I don't work at the hospital. I will be sitting there in some crappy hospital and nobody will help me and I'll get sent home and I won't, they won't find out I have, he had a cervical fracture. They won't find out all of the stuff and I will just end up dying because that's how it works. And it's really true. And it's really especially true for those of us who are sensitive. I can't have a surgery without having some complication because they didn't listen to me because they didn't hear me when I said, I'm really sensitive. I'm going to be puking. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be crying when I come out of the thing. Like I'm really sensitive. I have a lot of little reactions to this stuff. Can You be aware of that when you're dosing it. And every time they're like, don't worry, we've done this before. And then every time I'm having complications because they don't listen. They try to make me average. They try to make me what we know what that means. You don't know what it means. I am really sensitive. I might be high functioning, but my sensitivity is high. Like people you who are really outliers in ways that you can actually see. Mine is more hidden, but that doesn't make it not there. I have a lot of conditions. I have them mildly. They make my life harder in anything that's trying to make me average because I am not. Because I'm not average, I struggle with people like Bob, particularly, who see the world like, it's not that bad. Let's not be so freaking out. Well, it's not that bad if you're rich. It's not that bad if you have access to amazing healthcare. It's not that bad if you work in a healthcare system and you're a priority. That makes it all not that bad. But for the rest of us, it makes it freaking lethal, potentially. We have to be logical and my sister, she goes out with the mask all the time. She makes her daughter wear a mask all the time. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, you, you're you over the top. You're over the top. But my sister's really worried about her daughter. She only has one child. She doesn't want her to get sick. She doesn't want her to miss out either. So she asked her to wear a mask at school. She asked her to wear this stuff because she's worried about her health. It is reasonable. We are in an era of the beginning of pandemics. There'll be more and more and more. It's just known. If you read the Limits to Growth book, they talk about how the pandemics would start in 2020 and they nailed it. And they talked about how they will come more and more and more. It's part of the degradation of the environment. We do not have the woods and the trees and the natural space that 
that sort of filtered that for us. Now we're all together. The whole world is global. We can all catch everything from everyone. And if somebody gets something and it starts there, it is going to be like dominoes because we're all traveling. And the future will be spaces where we sort of go to to get away from that. And the rich are pretty happy. Like they're like, oh, we'll just go to our New Zealand mansion or we'll go here or go there. But the rich are interesting in the sense that do they not realize that the people that they're going to hire and coming to and keep those places all up and, and running, those people are going to be infecting them. Those people are going to be on their spaces. And you can't actually truly insulate yourself if you have a mansion and you have all this stuff. You're the ones that are going to be around it. I'll actually be fine because I can just go off with my family, buy a farm, and we can all live on it and raise some chickens and do some gardening and make sure that it's not in some massive desert zone. And we'll be okay because we're creative. I mean, I'm really good at fixing stuff. I can figure anything out. My husband's the same way and kind of split it down the middle and we're, we're pretty good. My kids are like this too. I mean, I'm not really worried about my future. I don't think you should be really worried about yours. We have to worry about your present and getting prepared. But you, by doing so, will be the one that helps other people prepare for the future who are less sensitive than you. This is how it works. This is the whole process. The most sensitive are pushed out. They use their higher sensing to understand the change. They get in front of it. And then they get everyone else behind them and they help them lead forward. You will get sensitive and not sensitive people. You will get everyone. I'm starting with the most sensitive because that's where I am. And I will stay in this space. And those people who come up under me or come up with me or however it works out, I'm not really sure. Those people will take other people and grow those groups and those groups and those groups. It is not the most intelligent or most sensitive or most whatever who make the most money. It's actually the ones that are just a little bit above average that do because they're the ones that can reach out to the most amount of people. I am not close to average. I, I really do question every day what average is doing because it doesn't make sense to me because my brain resolves my emotions. So emotions are information. Emotions are logic. Emotions are useful. Emotions, uh, when you tell me to not have emotions, I want to laugh at you because it's like saying don't have intelligence. But other people are going to need help with their emotions more so than I am. And so what I'm doing is training those who can help because I have full clarity on them and I can teach you how to get there and then you can teach somebody else and, and so on and so forth. My point to you is all of these things now are, are saying, hey, it's not okay to be average and we're just starting. That's a good thing for us. It's not a good thing for average, but it's the beginning of the tide turning. And I'll put these articles on there. I say go subscribe to Doomer. Subscribe to me, please, too, because, you know, I have, like, a very few people. And just know that it's the beginning of change. So the other article I thought was really great was the Normalcy Bias article. And they were talking, it's got a great picture on the front of it. And it's got the mountains burning, and these people are all outside, like, watching it, like, oh, this is cool. The mountain's got a wildfire, it's burning, and it's, this is fun to watch. And it's, wow, the world's burning, and you're outside with your friends having a powwow, checking it out, like, watching stargazing or something. This is our life. This is our new reality. We are going to have people who are, this is interesting. Let's just watch the world burn. I don't really get it. I don't know if they think it's not going to touch them unless they're poor. Then it's another story. But they're sort of not as sensitive to it. And I don't know if it's just all the conditioning and all that time that they learned to not be sensitive or they're just cruel or <laughs> I'm not really sure what it is. The people who are not understanding that this is coming home to them. And I see this even with the Israeli Hamas conflict, that will be coming here. That is going to come over here. That conflict is one that's been simmering for a long time, but it's going to spread. And everybody's going to be conflict because that land, the land that's useful is going to be harder. The U.S. is expected to like have a huge chunk of land, which is the Midwest and the West, just turn to desert, right? You cannot live in desert if the Colorado River is all dried up out there. You cannot live if the rivers don't have anything there was another article we I saw on OK Doomer that was talking about, hey, the um, in Arizona, they were renting, the, the Saudi Arabians were renting this huge bound of farmland that was pulling in, like, was pulling from the aquifers for the, under, the Colorado River way more than they were allowed. And that's why the state attorney general of Arizona was, I'm deleting these leases. This is no longer. He got rid of them. But before that, they were pulling in excessive amounts of water while the river's going dry. And there's parts of Arizona that don't even have water right now. They don't have running water. You have to bring it in. There are unincorporated areas outside of different cities of Arizona. But the fact that the Saudi Arabians were pulling all this water, excessive amounts, way past what they were actually paying for and had leased legally for, 
to water alfalfa to feed cows that was going over for milk and, and meat to Saudi Arabia, it's ridiculous, it's undermining us, and it's just complete and utter lack of foresight, oversight. This is what money does. We don't even check this stuff. We're, we're so lackadaisical. As long as somebody's paying somebody off, there's nobody's protecting us. Nobody cares. Our government is, let's focus on Trump being slightly insane, or let's focus on Jim Jordan not being able to get his speakership, or let's focus on all the, these antics that are going on in politics. It's ridiculous. Nobody's actually working and doing the job they're supposed to be doing. They're all screaming and fighting like teenage middle school children. I don't even get it. My point is that we have to kind of look out for ourselves now. You being spatially gifted, high sensing, and having all this understanding of the spaces around you and modeling it in your brain, all of that rolls up to understanding. If you need to understand it more and how to go into it, first off, you need to be free. And secondly, you need to be able to interpret your emotions. And those are things that you will learn gradually with freedom with someone helping you understand what's going on there, with reframing and knowing what your healthy is. Like, don't know what our healthy is. We're taught against it. We're taught that we're supposed to work for other people. We're not supposed to think for ourselves. And we're supposed to do what we're told. Guys, that's not actually being an adult. Adults do what they need to do without being told. That's not what we're taught in the system. We have a system that has created a generation of, of infantile adults. And you can see it very clearly in the boomers. You can see it very clearly in my group. You can see it. But there are some of us who didn't fit in. We are the neurodivergence. And we had to grow up. We had to grow up and be be, be moms and dads for other people and, and lead the way. I was beaten soundly for this. I was beaten soundly for being the adult in my family because my parents were both very infantile and waiting for somebody to come and rescue them all the time. I was beaten because it made them look bad. And so I had to do the job with well making them look good. This is our freaking whole system right now. I see this all through corporate America. You're supposed to make your boss look good, even though he's incompetent at his job or she's incompetent at her job. If they're incompetent at their job and you're supposed to make them look good, that's asinine. That's a crazy system. And that's our system. I was constantly having to make people look good and they were constantly letting me know what my deficiencies were. And I was like, gosh, I could go all day on what yours are. It's amazing. You have one level up on me. You probably make 10 grand more than me. And you're letting me know all day long how I'm not doing your job right. And you're not even doing the job. I'm doing your job and my job. And yet you spend all your time browbeating me into the ground so that I know my place. I know my place. My place is not here. That's what I know. You also need to realize that there's there's value in going out and working for others. There's a lot of value in it. I learned a lot of stuff very quickly. The smarter you are, the more sensitive you are, the more you're going to learn really, really fast. And we need to get you to be a little probably more selfish. We need to get you realizing that you're amazing and that you can figure this all out on your own and that you have to go out in the world and look everything as an education. Working for others is an education. Working with others is an education. Working, to, But it's not you that needs to change so much. It, you do need to grow. We all need to grow. There's no wrongs or rights on that one. But you just need to keep going in the way you're going. You just need to be who you are and you just need to delight in what you what you're supposed to be. I think we have so much potential. It's been untapped and now we just need to manifest it and we'll be running the world. I still think we need an artist group. I still think we need a SAG or a, some sort of collective so that we're protecting each other so that we can get healthcare at reasonable cost so that we can meet each other's needs and so we can have reasonable expectations. The schedules are killing us. The schedules are killing us. I talked with Beth Ann for a podcast today and, and she was saying, when did you know? When did you know you needed to positively disintegrate? There wasn't ever a time I didn't know. I think the most apparent time was when somebody where I lived left their kid in a car because they just were so tired and they left the baby in the car and they went to work and came back and the baby died. And I remember thinking, this person's working too much and this person could have been me because I am working too much. I'm a single parent. I have a small child and I'm working all the time. I'm never sleeping. And I, there's many times where I drove past his school and went halfway to work before I realized I never dropped him off and I would go back and I'd be late for work. Oh my God, that could have been horrible. And then when that happened, I was like, Oh, I have to figure out something. I have to get less going on. I can't work all this and do all this and sustain this forever. I will die. Somebody will die. I couldn't live with that. I couldn't live with that. I did find healthier people. I did bring them into my circle. I was able to get down, but my sensitivity is so high. My seizures are real. My POTS is real. All of those things are real for me. So I had to figure out a way, but I did it using my higher sensing. I did it 
using my gut. I did all of those things by understanding who I was and trusting what I could do, what I knew and going into what I didn't. And so I could fully cognitively realize it. We are so brilliant and we are denied it. We are so capable and we are denied it. I only want gifted neurodivergence in my corner because when I give you something, you take it and create amazingness. I'm not gonna give you something you don't like to do. I'm gonna try to give you something you do like to do. We all learn though by doing things we love to do and a little bit we don't. So if we were to take the 80-20 rule, it's really true. If you do 80% of things you love to do, you will learn that extra 20 in the process of doing those 80s to make them better. That's how it works. That's what I've done with my children and they've turned out fantastic. Our system is the opposite. It's like they make you do 80% of what you don't want and you get 20 what you do and so you burn out. The more sensitive you are, the more, more you burn out. But again, I will say it again, the future belongs to us. All we need to do is go into it and figure out where our niche is. And I want you to do that. I want you to do it as soon as possible because things are getting worse. And the sooner we get on this, the sooner you transition, the sooner you pivot, the sooner you build a world where you get to lead, where you get to create, where you get to be your best self. There's so much opportunity out there. We just need to help ourselves get over our emotions to realize that they are there to help us move into the right space, that they are there to help us be motivated, help us focus, and that our system has thwarted all of that. We're working against ourselves, not with ourselves. If you learn to work with yourself, you learn to use your emotions as part of your intellect, or you learn to move into things that you like, you will eventually move to things you don't and you will be a well-rounded person. I spent my whole life trying to be a well-rounded person and when I finally stopped trying is when I got there. It's kind of ironic that me working against myself, beating myself up, forcing myself into the box, trying to make sure I fit there and like be who I wasn't, when I stopped being that was when I finally well I got well-rounded because I had more energy, I had more focus, my overexcitabilities, my cognitive stamina for doing things I hated was no longer being constantly tested. When you run out of your cognitive stamina for school, for life, or whatever, you're now in overexcitability land. And when you are in overexcitability land, your body's leading, your brain is shut down because it's trying to take a break, and your body's taking over, and you have no self-control. This is the problem with this whole self-control thing. It's meant to control the most sensitive. We don't have self-control when we cannot escape to recharge, when we cannot escape to process all our inputs. We have none. If you do what you need to do for you, you have an abundance. All right, that's it for my podcast this week. I hope this was valuable. Circle back with me. Let me know what you need to hear to help you get where you need to go. Thanks so much, everyone. You take care. The views, information, and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent Gifted NT Incorporated, Lillian Skinner, or the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast. This podcast, Lillian Skinner, and Gifted ND Incorporated are not responsible and do not verify the accuracy of the information contained in this podcast series. The primary purpose of this podcast is to inform and educate. The Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast is only available for private, non-commercial use. Any other use of the information contained within this podcast must be done with express written approval and knowledge of Lillian Skinner. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute any part of this podcast. The developer assumes no liability for this podcast or its use on any other podcast or other media.